Hey, San Diego Four Square Church. Well, we we are here at Josephine's, and we heard that um, one way that we could encourage and help them out is to bring some snacks and especially diet soda. So we're here. We went and we got diet soda. We got different kinds of soda, some snacks, chips, cookies, and different things to be able to encourage the residents and the workers as they're quarantined and held up inside. And so just a practical way to meet needs. And thank you so much for giving so that we could go out and meet the practical needs in our community. We love you, we believe in you. Thanks so much, have a good day. Hello, Stanwood Foursquare. This is Cliff and Prudy. We want to thank you all for your support and reaching out with all your love, well wishes and prayers. Cliff was on prayer chains all over, but the biggest prayer chain happened at Stanwood Foursquare. God bless you all and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hello and welcome to Stanwood Foursquare Church Online. My name is Courtney and I serve on our hospitality team and in our high school ministry here. As we begin our time, know that our service will last about an hour with worship and a message. Today we continue in our series in the book of James, Faith Works. At any time during our service, you can access live prayer with one of our pastors, live chat with our church family, or fill out an online connect card at the link provided. If you're looking for a safe and easy way to give, you'll see a link at the top of this page to give or download our church app to access giving there. Here at Stanwood Foursquare, we love God and we seek to learn his words and ways. And one way we get to do that together is here online. We are so glad you're joining us today. Let's worship together. Breaks the power of sin and darkness. His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your
justice Turns like the sun All of its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place Is the lamb who was slain? Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. And worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. And worthy
breath in our lives so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lives so we pour out our praise face of adversity, we could never find the strength to trust without faith. James, faith works. Well, hello church, Stand with Foursquare, so good to be together again today in our new reality, our new norm of gathering online for this next season of time. Before we jump into reading the scriptures. If you have your Bible, I'd encourage you to grab it. Maybe you have your phone. We're going to be in the book of James in chapter two today. Uh, hopefully you've been continuing in reading and studying the book of James in the weeks leading up to Easter, the Lent season. We've been encouraging you to read the five chapters of James every week for six weeks straight. And uh, it's just been so transformational of, as I've been doing that and learning to meditate on God's word uh, it, we can read over information so quickly, but to dive into it and let God's word speak to us and shape us is very, very powerful. Well, in this last week, so many things have happened. I just wanted to share a couple of them. Is, is one, as many of you are aware, is Cliff Marston, one of the great members of our church who serves in so many capacities with our middle school students, serves as an usher and greeter. He, uh, he contracted the COVID-19 virus. He was in the hospital, but this week he was, uh, he was released. Uh, him and his wife, Purdy, they send their thanks and gratitude to the church for praying for them. Um, I got to video chat with him this week and just see the good things that God is doing in his life. See a video from him, and uh, we're, we're going to pray for his continued healing. It, it's a journey. Uh, now, I know that there's other people in the church who have been ill. We've been praying for other families who, uh, who have people who have the virus. And so, church, let's be, continue to pray that our God is a God of healing. Our God is a God who restores. Our God is a God who preserves life. So let's continue to pray that God would heal people. And then also, I know just a point of prayer is, is there's financial realities, as many people have been uh, asked not to report to work. Uh, and some people have not been able to be paid. But we're going to pray that God would miraculously provide in many ways as we, uh, we go through this together. And uh, church, you know, I'd love to see you eye to eye. I'd love to give you a hug, a handshake, a high five. And, but we're doing that through the spirit of God that unites us together. Well, as we dive into the book of James, just a couple of things we need to be reminded of is, first is this, is the book of James was written by the half-brother of Jesus, Jesus' little brother. And so when James talks about these things, to me, I pay attention because think about this, what would your older brother have to do for you to worship him? And James ultimately gives his life for the sake of Jesus, his older half-brother, 
when he's killed, when he's martyred at the hands of the Romans in about 62 or 65 AD. It's amazing that his brother became his Lord. And, and James not only laid down his life for Jesus, but he, he gave his life to the church that Jesus left. And Jesus was the early church leader of the church in Jerusalem. And quickly, persecution broke out at the church in Jerusalem. And the people of God began to scatter all over the Roman Empire. But James stayed in Jerusalem, and he was the leader. And he would write these letters. And this letter that we have from the book of James is an account of his teachings to a scattered and a displaced church who are unable to meet together in one location. And I think it's very timely, and God knew what he was doing when he had us study the book of James uh, many months ago as we were planning for that, that God knew that we were going to be in a season of being a scattered church. Now, that doesn't diminish our mission. It doesn't diminish the value of God. It doesn't diminish what God is doing in us and through us and among us. In fact, one of the things I was reading this week about James that just reminded him, reminded me of, a, of the great pastor and leader he was, that, that James had a nickname. Church tradition tells us that James had a nickname. And they called him this. They called him Old Camel Knee. Old camel knee. I think we have a picture of what a camel knees look like. And, and camels, they kind of have gnarly knees because they, they, when they get down, they get down on their knees. And James had this nickname because he spent so much time on his knees praying for this displaced church. And boy, I, <laughs> one of the things I was reminded as I read that is I've spent a lot more time on my knees praying this week, praying for you, church, praying for, for those who are sick, praying for our country, praying for this world, praying that God would bring healing and restoration and a sense of normal back into the world in which we live. And uh, let's get some camel knees together. Um, don't say the other thing, camel knees. We, we, we all want to be a people of camel knees in the world in which we live. But let's read in James chapter 2, starting at verse 1 together. And here's what James says. He says, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and a fine clothes, and a filthy man, a poor man, he, he wears filthy old clothes, and he also comes in. If you, spay, if you pay special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or you sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and in to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. They are not the ones who are dragging you into court. Are they, are they not the ones who are blasphem, blaspheming the noble name of who, him you belong? Verse 8, and if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing right? But if you show favoritism, you sin and you convict, and you, you show sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. James has these harsh words. He says, if we, just, if, we, if we think that we just keep most of the law, it doesn't matter. Even if we break a little thing, we break all the law. And he's going to give us an example. He says this, verse 11. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. So if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. We want to parse out what part of the law we keep. And James is telling us, boy, we are all lawbreakers. And then he concludes in verse 12. He says this, speak and act as those who are being judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 
Now, for us to even begin to grasp and understand these words of James, we need to understand a huge worldview, a huge value, understand how Jesus sees the world. And here's the first thing, if you're taking notes, I want you to follow us, this is this, is we need to see the value, we need to see value the way that Jesus sees value. We need to see value the way that Jesus sees value. So James is telling us that in the early church, there was these issues that a rich person, someone who was fine dressed, had Armani, they walked into a church service and they were treated with special honor. But at the same time, someone who walked in who was poor and didn't have nice clothes as they were devalued, they were asked to sit on the floor or stand in the back. And it's part of our human nature is we want to judge people and we want to associate value to people based on outward appearance. But Jesus in his teaching, in his kingdom that he wants us to be a part of, that James is helping us to understand is this, is the kingdom of God, in God's kingdom, in the way that God designed the world, in the kingdom that God is restoring, the kingdom that God is bringing, the kingdom that Jesus brought forth into this earth, and we as followers of Jesus are called in to live into is this, is that the imago Dei, the image of God, dwells in every human being. It dwells in every human being, and we have to understand that every human, no matter social economic status, no matter gender, no matter race, no matter creed, no matter anything, has immense value in God's kingdom. And it's something that we have to understand. It has to be integrated into the life of someone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus is that we see the value that Jesus sees in every human being. If we go all the way back to Genesis in the creation narrative, we see this. We see that God created uh, in five days. He created the, the, the heavens. He created the stars and the sky and the light and all the creatures and the ocean and the land and all the plants and the animals But on the sixth day, God did something very unique and different than the rest of creation. It's from the creation that he had had formed and spoken into existence. He gathered some dust, the narrative tells us in Genesis 1 and 2. And out of that dust, he formed humanity. And that That humanity was merely just a piece of flesh and bone. And unlike all the rest of creation, God came down and didn't just speak, but he breathed life. (sighs) He breathed life into humanity. He breathed, breathed life into us. Imparting the Latin word is the imago Dei, the image of God on humanity. Different than all of creation. We were made from dust, and one day we will return to dust. But unlike all of the other creation, the breath of God has been breathed into our lungs, making us unique, making humanity special. And this is a challenging thing because in our predominant culture today, most people think the problem with the world, the problem with, with, uh, with ecosystems, the problem with creation is humanity. But if we understand that the way God designed it is that creation is for us. God designed creation for us to enjoy, for us to steward, for us to experience, to explore, to take care of, to nurture, and to steward. And that's a radically different view of the value of humanity. Because if we have a predominant worldview of our culture today that says humans are the problems with the world, boy, we don't see the value in humanity, and God's worldview, God's idea for us that James is telling us is we must understand the value of every human being. The the psalmist in Psalm 139, I want to encourage you this week, if you have some time, go read Psalm 139. As I was studying this week, these words have just brought such comfort to me, and it's about how God is everywhere. And the psalmist writes, "There's, there's nowhere that I can go from your presence. God, I can go to the highest mountain." I can go to the depths of the sea and you're there. There's nowhere that I can run from God's presence that is everywhere. And in Psalm 139, verse 13, this scripture speaks so much to me. He writes this. 
For you created me, God. You created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And if that doesn't remind us the value of every human being, it's so important that we understand that, that humans have immense value. But there's something in us, there's something in our nature, our sinful nature, that we want to create high and low values on people. I don't know if you've ever done this experiment, experiment, but I remember in school, in like sociology classes, we would do this, they called it the lifeboat experiment. And so a teacher would, would tell us like, hey, you're, in, you're stuck in a lifeboat with 10 people. But there's only food and water for eight. Who are you going to throw overboard? And it was this experiment that we had to try to value and justify our existence, that our life was meaningful, our life had value, our life had importance. And, and maybe you've been a part of a, a discussion like that, and it's hard and it's challenging to try to assess value to people's life. And, you know, maybe if someone's old, we should let them go because they've already lived a, a life. If there's a, a kid, we should let them live longer. It, it's so challenging. We want to do that. And, and here's what I want to tell you that God does. God never looks at the human race and says, you have more value than that person. God looks at all seven plus billion people who are living and breathing on planet Earth today, and he says, you have value. And there is room on the lifeboat for all of you. There is resources. There's everything we need. We don't need to figure out who's going to get thrown off. And there's something in us that we want to create a hierarchical structure to who's in charge and who has value. Whether it's rich, whether it's poor, whether it's people who have power and influence or people who are lowly and are just struggling to get by and who need love and grace and mercy. And Jesus was always criticized. He was criticized for this. He was criticized for spending time with sinners. And that meant that he was with the poor. That meant that he was also with the rich tax collectors. He was with the prostitutes. He spent time with everybody in between. What he spent time with was marginalized people. People who were on the outside of culture who didn't feel, feel like they fit in. And in the first century, the Jewish idea of who belonged and who didn't belong was very strict, and a lot of people fell outside of feeling like they belonged. When I was thinking about this, I, I thought about a friend who, uh, who we grew up in ministry together, being trained in ministry, and we youth pastored at different churches, but we were together a lot at different meetings, and we're of similar age and, and had a lot of similar experiences. And about 10 years ago, 11 years ago now, when, when um, Anna and I came here to Stanwood and began to pastor, my friend moved to Los Angeles, and he planted a church in Hollywood. And uh, we, we didn't talk for a couple of years, but I kind of followed him online, and, and God began to do cool things. Their church began to grow, and they began to have uh, Hollywood stars show up at their church. And uh, my friend began to pastor people who, you know, we've seen in movies and, and different things. And, uh, and, and I just noticed my heart got getting a little hard. I'm like, what is my pastor friend doing reaching those people? What are they doing? Those are all just, I mean, I just, I just found myself sitting in a place of judgment over my friend. And about two years ago, we got to connect. We were at a meeting together, and I got to reconnect with them and said, how's it going? What's going on? And, and he just, we just started sharing about our churches and the assignments that God has us in. And, and, and as he began to just talk about the people in his church, my, my heart began to melt that it had been hard and thinking, why are you reaching Hollywood superstars? Come on. And, and he just started talking about the people that he ministers to. And, and you know the thing, it was of the same issues that you and I deal with. Insecurity. Relational challenges. Feeling like we don't belong. Feeling like everything's going on and somehow we don't fit into what's happening. And, and one of the things I've come to understand is when we talk about poverty, we, we talk about this in our missions training, poverty is not just a lack of money. Poverty is broken fractured relationships. And we all have a level of poverty in our life, of broken relationships that aren't healed and restored. 
And, and I realized that I had shown favoritism towards poor, normal people. I thought that's where God's really at is he's with the average, normal people. That's where we need to spend our time and minister to. But as I began to spend time with my friend, I realized that these Hollywood stars, they have just as much value in the eyes of God. And somebody's got to reach them. Somebody's got to tell them about Jesus. Somebody's got to tell them that God cares for them and he loves them and that they were knit together in their mother's womb and God has a plan and a purpose for their life. And isn't it funny? We can sit in a place of judgment. It's not just rich or poor. It can be social economic status. We can find this place where we sit in a place of judgment and James just says, none of it. We can't have it be a part of the church where one person has more value than another person. Now, James goes on and he says, so how do we, how do we address this issue? How do we not show favoritism? Because it's in all of us. There's something about it. We're, we're just wired this way. So often we show value to people who can add value to us. Sometimes we show value to people who will make us feel good. And people that don't add anything to us, we just kind of pass by, but how do we not show favoritism? And here's the remedy, two things. Two things James is gonna tell us to the remedy to not showing favoritism because it's a problem that we all face. The first one is this, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. James 2.8, if you really keep the royal commandment, maybe many of us have heard this as the golden rule that is found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself and you are doing right. This idea for us to love our neighbors as ourself. It is simple words, but it is hard to live out. And I think often we way overthink it. We oh way overthink it. What does it think to love my neighbor as myself? Because I don't know if you're like me, but when I think about loving my neighbor as myself, man, I don't think the best things about myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm more difficult on myself than anybody else is. And I'm more critical of me than anybody's ever been critical of me. And I'm thinking the last thing that, that my neighbor needs is for me to love me like I love me because most of the time I don't love me. But I think we're way overthinking that. That's, what, that's not what this is about. What James is telling us, what the scriptures are telling us, it goes all the way back to the book of Leviticus where God lays this rule that we're to love one another. And Jesus gives us a brilliant illustration to help us understand what it means to live out this ancient truth, to love your neighbor as yourself. In Luke chapter 10, a religious leader asked Jesus, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And what the guy is really asking, he's saying, hey Jesus, what's the minimum that I need to do to get in to heaven? And Jesus asked him the question, well, what do you think it is? And the man looks back and he gives this, this great answer. It's called the Shema. It's the ancient truth of scripture found in the book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looks at him and says, good job. You got the right answer. But then this guy, he just, he makes the biggest mistake. And the scripture says in Luke 10 that he wanted to justify himself. He wanted to make himself look good. And then he looks at Jesus and he asks this question. He says, well, then who's my neighbor? <laughs> and I can imagine Jesus just sitting there. He's at the batting plate. And it is a slow pitch right down the middle. And Jesus is going to get a home run. And he tells us one of his most famous parables. Boom, he hits it out of the park. And in response to that question, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Maybe many of us are familiar with this. But it's a story of a man who's on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's robbed. He's beaten. He's beaten. All of his possessions are stole from him and he's left for dead lying in a road. And first walks by a priest who was a religious leader of the Jewish people. He would have been a, a spiritual man which would have taught people how to follow the rules of God, would have modeled worship for the people. And he sees this man who is beaten and bleeding on the side of the road and the scripture says that he walked to the other side. He walked around this man. He got as far as he could from him and still stay on the road. And then a Levite, another spiritual leader. Another one who would have been, they would have looked through as a hero of the Jewish faith. He sees the same man beaten and bleeding. And again, he walks away as far as he can. And then Jesus says this. And then a Samaritan walked up to the man. And it's hard for us to even grasp. 
But the Jewish people that Jesus is talking to, they hated the Samaritan. They viewed them as less than human. They didn't have value. And Jesus says the Samaritan sees this Jewish man who's been beat up and left for dead. And he has compassion on him. He has mercy on him. And he walks over and he bandages his wounds. And he does triage. He does what he can to help him. And he lifts him up and he puts him on his donkey. And he goes down the road and he finds the nearest place to care for this man. It's, it's in, it's a hotel. And the night he stays with them and he takes care of them. And the next morning he, he gets the innkeeper and he pays them a huge sum of money and he says, hey, take care of this man until he's well. And if I come back, if he's incurred more of a debt, I, I will pay it. I will pay it. And the people listening are just dumbstruck. And then Jesus asked this question. He says, who showed the man? Who was the neighbor in the story? Who showed the man a neighborly act? And the crowd couldn't even say it. They couldn't even put the words in their mouth that the Samaritan was the one who modeled neighborly behavior. And Jesus kind of drops the mic and he walks off. And so in the time, in the place, in the world we're living in, you know what the world needs? You know what people who claim to be followers of Jesus, you know what we need to do more than ever before? We need to love our neighbor. And our instinct is to want to ask the question, well, who's my neighbor? Let me tell you, every human being on planet earth is your neighbor, but your neighbor might also be your neighbor. And in this time where we might be locked in our homes and not be able to be under quarantine and be close, we, we might actually really need to show neighborly love. Do you even know your neighbor's names? Do you know the people who lives in the house next to you? It's time for the followers of God to not overthink the teachings of Jesus that says, love your neighbor as yourself. The words that James says to the early church, the words that Jesus says to to those he's teaching and the words that are taught in the Old Testament. We can't overthink it and we just gotta love our neighbors. When we see someone in need, we run and we don't walk away. When we see someone who needs something, we run towards that and we see what we can do to help the situation. We throw them on our camel, we throw them in our car, we bandage their wounds, we provide for their needs. We do what we can do to meet people's needs. That's the remedy to showing favoritism is to be people who truly love our neighbors. The second thing that James tells us is the remedy to the things in, that is in all of us, to value people at different places, to have a scale of the value of human life. Is the first is to love your neighbor. The second is this, is to show mercy. To show mercy. Verse 12 and 13 of chapter two of the book of James says this. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what James is really telling us is we all want God's mercy. And mercy is this. Mercy is God not giving the judgment that we deserve. And we all want mercy. We don't want to get the things that we deserve. God's withholding his punishment upon us for our sin. And we all want God's mercy. We want our friends to be merciful to us. We want our spouses to be merciful. We want our kids, we want everyone we know to be merciful to us. And here's what James says. And it's challenging, difficult words. And James says this, if you want mercy, you better show mercy. If you want God on the day of judgment to give you mercy, you have better been a person of mercy. You must have shown mercy to those around you because here's what we want to do. We want to sit in the place of judgment and determine value and worth. But what God wants from his people, what God wants from you and me is to be, to be a people that see the value in every human life. To live it out, to, to love 
our neighbors in practical, intangible ways to not overthink it, to not ask the question, who's my neighbor? But when we see someone in need, we run towards those in need and we help them in their time of need. And we, as the people of God, followers of Jesus, disciples, we show mercy. We live mercy. We're the Samaritan who lives out mercy to those that we see day in and day out. And so church, we're living in a time, we're living in a place where, where we need to love our neighbors. And, and what if we loved our neighbors not because we had to, not because we're in a time of crisis, not because the governor's asking us to, but because the Jesus Christ who rose from the dead, who died for us, whose spirit lives in us, whose Holy Spirit empowers us, what if we loved our neighbors because we are compelled by the spirit of God that dwells in us? And what if we showed mercy? We were known as a people of mercy, not because we had to, not because of time of crisis, because we're compelled by the spirit of God that lives in us. And so church, I, I wanna pray for us as we end and I wanna encourage you this week. Would you show mercy? Would you love your neighbor? And in this time, it's hard for the church to program all of these things. And love and mercy are not a program that the church is supposed to run. Love and mercy are supposed to be an outflow of who the people of God are. So I'd challenge you, would you love your neighbor in practical and tangible ways? When you find yourself asking that question, who's my neighbor, fight it. And remember, everybody's your neighbor. And would you show mercy to those around you? We're gonna be in tight spaces, so show mercy, show love to those around you. Can we pray, church? Lord, we thank you that you are good and you're faithful. Thanks for the words of James, Lord, that helps shape our whole worldview of understanding that every human being has such immense value that we can't even grasp it. Lord, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we were knit together in our mother's wombs. And Lord, so for those of us who are, who, who, who are experiencing this today, Lord, I just have a sense that some of us are questioning our value. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just enter hearts right now, wherever we find ourselves. And Lord, the breath, the word of God would be spoken into our ears and into our hearts that says, you are valuable. You're my son. You're my daughter. And Lord, would you help us to love our neighbors? And would you help us to show mercy? God, thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Would you be with us as a church in the days ahead as we love and we serve you to reach our community, to reach our church, and even beyond. Well, I love you and I believe in you. So great to be together today. Pray that God would be with you, that God would richly bless you. We're going to be praying for you and excited to see what God is going to continue to do in us and through us and among us. Goodbye, church. Hope to see you real soon. Thank you for joining us today. If you are in need of prayer, we would love to pray with you and for you. Please fill out our online connect card found at the link at the top of this page, and we look forward to connecting with you. Hey, San Diego Foursquare Church. Well, we're, we are here at Josephine's and we heard that um, one way that we could encourage and help them out is to bring some snacks and especially diet soda. So we're here, we went and we got diet soda, we got different kinds of soda, some snacks, chips, cookies, and different things to be able to encourage the residents and the workers as they're quarantined and held up inside. And so just a practical way to meet needs. And thank you so much for giving so that we could go out and meet the practical needs in our community. We love you. We believe in you. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Hello, Stanwood Foursquare. This is Cliff and Prudy. We want to thank you all for your support and reaching out with all your love, well wishes, and prayers. Cliff was on prayer chains all over, but the biggest prayer chain happened at Stanwood Court Square. God bless you all and thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.